Good morning, everybody. I've tried to look at all the things that loom out in our future that are potentially threatening to our industry, to coffee writ large, and to specialty coffee, uh, the, the niche that we uh, ostensibly occupy, going back and looking at these dire warning speeches. And, you know, I, I have been for a while telling you, hey, this terrible thing is likely to happen. I don't want to brag too much, but a lot of the things that I anticipated happening are happening right now. We're going to talk about price. We're going to talk about price in some ways like this. This is the, the C market, the futures price uh, over the course of 40 years or so. Um, and uh, today it's occupying that space between 90 and 95. Terrible space if you are in the business of growing green coffee and uh, growing coffee and selling it. Uh, that, that's not a comfortable space. And you can see it's got a particular behavior. It tends to run up into big spikes and then slowly drop down into an awful place and then climb up and then get a big spike. You can usually identify those spikes. There's something that happens. So the first one all the way to your left there is going to be a frost in Brazil. It had lots of demand and not enough supply and prices went way up. And then as coffee came back in the market, it came down again. But the thing you'll note about this is it's a cyclical pattern. It is a classic boom and bust cycle. This kind of cycle is, uh, is very typical for uh, tree crops, orchard crops like coffee, where they have a relatively long uh, cycle of, of production, and you can influence that production uh, fairly quickly, and then you can also add to that production. If you drew a straight line through this, you'd, you'd be able to find a median point, and you'd be able to say, hey, coffee seems to hover around this number all the time. There's no adjustment for inflation in this. None. Rick, how is this a crisis? This is... This is the normal behavior of the marketplace. It's not a crisis, it's normal, expected behavior. But at this exact moment in time, there are hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of, uh, of folks who depend on coffee for their livelihood that find themselves in crisis. This conversation now is gonna go down two different paths. One of them is really about commercial coffee, just an ordinary cup of coffee. And some of you in the room here, this is your business. You, your principal business is coffee with a small C. You grow or roast or distribute or vend or somehow deliver coffee into the world. And then some of you are in that niche of specialty coffee and who are very, very focused on this sort of exceptional coffee experience that we identify as specialty coffee. Um, I traditionally have gotten up here and, and given this, uh, this dire warning speech um, and there's a whole bunch of things that we still need to be worried about. Uh, they haven't gone away. We haven't successfully addressed them. And normally I like to sort of lead into the, <clears throat> the rough stuff. But I'm just going to go right out. So first there's this. There is definitely uh, anthropogenic global warming taking place and it is having impacts on our planet and it's having substantial impacts on agriculture and it's having particularly substantive impacts on subtropical agriculture, mostly manifested as huge variations in traditional weather patterns, uh, but there's more to come and it, none of it's gonna be very good. Here's another one. I, I first produced a slide like this uh, in this city in 2013. The coffee produced by the individual countries that produce coffee has consolidated dramatically. The top five producers in the world today produce north of 75%, north of three quarters of all of the coffee produced in the world. The top two producers, just Brazil and Vietnam, between them in the past coffee year, produced just a little under 100 million bags of coffee. All right. That's for a world that in its totality wanted to drink about 160 million bags of coffee, but on the export side really only wanted about 105 to 110 million bags for consumption. And this is a condition that's heading towards a, a sole supplier scenario, and that's a terrifying thing. And if you have to have a sole supplier, you should be a really good partner with a really good relationship with that sole supplier. And I don't think we're there. If you're in the specialty side, remember, this is aimed at the people unnamed in the room who are really in the commercial side of the business. This consolidation is largely due to efficiency. So the most efficient producers have risen to the top of production. So our friends in Brazil 
They haven't done anything wrong. They've done everything right. What they've done is become very, very efficient coffee producers, and that's allowed them to grow and to thrive uh, in most of these market cycles. Three, four, and five, which this year is uh, Colombia, um, Indonesia, and Honduras, in that order, are much less efficient. And uh, if you look at that efficiency, when you slip below the cost of production and become inefficient for the market you're going to deliver into, you've got a real existential crisis. And of those three countries, really, two of them for sure are at an existential moment in their coffee world, and the third may or may not be. I want to reinforce again, this is a supply and demand issue. We were in good equilibrium. And frankly, equilibrium is a great thing in, the, in, the, in this world because you can identify your costs and your, and your uh, potential sales pretty easily there if you have equilibrium. But if you look in the last two cycles, in 17 and 18, what you see is a surplus of production. And in total, it's seven or eight million bags across those two years. But that's enough to dramatically depress prices. So this downturn you're seeing in the nominal price is fundamental. It's driven by what you would expect to drive it. There's more coffee than there are buyers. This market is, in, is fundamentally disposed uh, to respond to supply and demand, and we're in an oversupply scenario. In the commercial Traders always will tell you the cure for low prices is low prices, right? And what they're saying is that market fundamentals will apply. If prices stay low enough, long enough, people will stop producing coffee and stop selling it, and eventually the oversupply will go away, and you'll pass through equilibrium into one of those boom cycles where prices will go up. But for producers who are, who are in this wrong end of this cycle, who are, who are producing coffee below their cost of production and have been for a number of years, to suggest to them that the cure is very simple, to fight price to a draw, is insufficient. It's not enough. In many places, coffee has simply chased low-cost labor. Uh, and make no mistake, the system was set up to do that. This idea of a, of a colonial trading system that takes advantage of nearly free land and nearly free labor to deliver a nearly free product to people who can commercialize it is this is the description, not only of the coffee business, but of cocoa and, and a dozen other uh, tropical commodities. Just to define a little bit about what we're talking about here, and I'm going to start by giving you a disclaimer. This is Rick Reinhardt's thinking about specialty coffee. But I tried to make it easy, and I put the important words in color for you there. The key concepts that specialty coffee is from a known geographic origin. We know where it came from. We know that that coffee came from a specific place. And it's special in part because it carries with it that taste of place. And we have to get past thinking about coffee as a green coffee bean. We do, a lot of us do, and when we talk about specialty coffee and when we've had a, an official definition from the SCA, it really focuses on that raw material. But there are exactly zero consumers out there who are thinking about coffee in that fashion. We have to be talking about a differentiated product, a product that's different than the vast sea of commercial coffee, and that garners a premium for that difference. But it does so at the cost of the dignity, the value, or the well-being of the people and the land that produced it. It can't be specialty coffee. What can be done? Well, the first thing to be done is to really start to Think about your engagement in the value chain here. We've got to start to understand that our value chain is dependent on a relatively equal strength across the chain or it will fail. So what can we do about it? I'm going to throw out three or four ideas. You should know. Here's one. This is a friend of mine in, uh, in uh, Melbourne, Australia, and in California. Delivering a coffee grown, a micro lot grown by an individual producer in uh, Huila, Colombia. And what's interesting to me to this is that that farmer is really a partner in his business. And he's willing to tell you how much of a partner he is. If you look in the bottom right hand corner there, what's printed there is the farm gate and FOB pricing delivered to that farmer at the point of purchase of this coffee. Both farm gate and FOB, which is really sort of going out naked in the world, but it's something that, the, that this company has committed to doing, to saying, hey, we're going to pay a, a, a good price for a good value, and we're going to talk about it out loud. 
we must discover ways to change our current monologue into a dialogue in which the buyers are attentive listeners. And you'll hear a lot of ideas about how to do that, and I promise you we'll deliver more to you.